Pleasure to welcome you to the symposium on Insiders and Outsiders, the Construction of Jewish Identity and Culture. This event is held under the auspices of the Melton Coalition for Creative Interaction and supported by the generous endowment provided by Samuel Mendel Melton shortly before his death in 1993. Samuel Melton was one of the few visionary philanthropists who supported generously Jewish education over 50 years ago. His wife Florence continued that great tradition with support and innovative thinking on the challenges of Jewish education. The Melton Coalition brings together scholars from the three Melton Centers, the Melton Research Center at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, the Melton Center for Jewish Studies at the Ohio State University, and the Melton Center for Jewish Education here at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. This year, the three centers joined forces in organizing this exciting symposium, and this is the third and last of the meetings. The other two held recently in New York and in Columbus. Today, we will explore Jewish identity boundaries and construction from the perspectives of three periods in Jewish history, late antiquity, middle ages, and recent modern history. I would like to thank all of those who were instrumental in organizing this important project. Matt Godish from Ohio State University, Barry Holtz from JTS, and my dear colleague Michael Gillis from this Melton Center. I'm also pleased to announce that tomorrow Monday at 12.30 we will meet again the three distinguished speakers together with faculty and students from the Melton Center for Jewish Education. We will discuss lessons and implications of the ideas and conceptualizations presented today for the study of aspects related to Jewish education in culturally poor societies of today. All of you are cordially invited to join us tomorrow, as I said, at 12.30 in the seminar room number 303 at the Melton Center. So please let me introduce the first of the speakers, Mark Hirschman alias Menachem. Mark Hirschman teaches rabbinic thought and midrash at the Melton Center for Jewish Education at the New University of Jerusalem, where he holds the Mandel Chair in Jewish Education. He serves also as the director of the Institute for Research on the Land of Israel at Yad Ben Tzvi in Jerusalem. Among his books are A Library of Genius, Jewish and Christian Interpretations of the Bible in Late Antiquity in 1996, Torah for the Entire World, a Universalist School of Rabbinic Thought, Kibbutz al in 1999, and recently, the stabilization of rabbinic culture, 100 CD to 350 C text on education in the late antique context, by, uh, published by Oslo in 2009. Menachem will talk about a house of prayer for all people in rabbinic thought. Thank you, Menachem, please. Okay. This is uh, this is the third day of a road show. Professor Gamp helped, Professor John and I have been doing. We were a sellout in New York. We did okay in Columbus, and it's even better in Jerusalem. So, uh, but more seriously, let me get started. Um, uh, the idea here is insiders and outsiders, and I want to do it in two different ways. Um, one is inside and outside of the land of Israel. And the other is insiders and outsiders, Jews and non-Jews. And I hope to touch on both um, during the course of the talk. I can't do it without text. Uh, the Bible is in English, also in the Hebrew. The other, the Midrash is only in Hebrew, but I'll read it in English. So here we go. A house of prayer for all people, Isaiah 56, 7 in rabbinic thought. Isaiah 56, that's the number one on your handout, calls out to the foreigner, the Nechbena Nechar, and says, 
As to the foreigners who attach themselves to the Lord, I will bring them to my sacred mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. This is an ingathering of peoples who served God, loved God from afar. God will bring them to Jerusalem, gladly accept their sacrifices, bestow on them happiness in God's prayer house, since after all, God's house is a house of prayer for all peoples. Isaiah's notion of a house of prayer for all peoples remains also, if not primarily, a place of sacrifice, as indicated in the end of the verse. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar. It seems that this view, if we trust biblical scholarship, born in the exile, as we'll see further, further on, envisaged the two-pronged temple, sacrifice and prayer, which thrive side by side. This model goes back to earlier instances, such as Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel, where the pilgrimage sacrifice is accompanied by her spontaneous prayer. Moreover, even though God declares in Isaiah that the temple is a house of prayer for all people, the prophecy is addressed specifically to those foreigners or Gentiles who attach themselves to God, who keep the Sabbath and hold fast to my covenant. These foreign adherents of God are rewarded by a, what do we call it, Tagli? By a uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem, what do we call it? Birthright. 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 Birthright, yeah, anyway. These foreign adherents of God are rewarded by a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and will acceptance of their sacrifices. <coughs> These ritual acts of prayer and sacrifice are normative, ongoing rituals. This differs, for example, from Isaiah 2, which saw the Temple Mount as being the end of day's site for instruction and judgment of the nations. In John Levinson's early and important essay from Temple, the synagogue, 1 Kings 8, which we'll move to soon, he had proved the affinity, the likeness between 1 Kings 8, Solomon's prayer, when he dedicated the temple, and our passage from Isaiah, emphasizing, I quote, the reinterpretation of the temple as a place of prayer is known from other 6th century literature, most prominently from what he calls 3rd Isaiah. The relevant passage in 1 Kings 8, 41-43, at the bottom of uh, uh, page 2 here, uh, number 2, the Gamel Nachri, or if a foreigner, or if a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a distant land for the sake of your name, for they shall hear about your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes to pray to this house, oh, here in your heavenly abode, and grant all that the foreigner asks you for. Thus all the peoples of the earth will know your name and revere you. Today I'll explore the impact of this exile, exilic broadening of the temple's role on post-Second Temple rabbinic thought regarding the temple both as a place of prayer and sacrifice for the Gentiles. <clears throat> Indeed, Levinson, at the end of his article, says... I quote, the liturgical order that the rabbis made normative, prayer, is only a temporary institution, while we, he says, await the final consummation of the divine plan. I'll get back to this, but his idea that this house of prayer, the final plan is going back to sacrifices. The rabbinic comments on these passages in Isaiah and Kings will shed light on how they saw the Gentiles' relationship in the past, to prayer and sacrifice in God's temple, which would surely serve as a roadmap for the eventual restoration, which Levinson thought was a matter of time. So I'm going to bring with two, three rabbinic sources which treat these two passages in the Bible and one other. I'm going to bring in very shortly with a curious, which is not in front of you, but instructive adaptation of 1 Kings 8 in the Tosefta. Where the, brachot, where the Tosefta discusses where do we face when we pray. We face this way, right? So you would know it well just by habit, but 1 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 6 
cover all the different directions about people who are outside the land, people in the land, people in Jerusalem, people in the temple itself, and finally, also, uh, the Tosefta deals with someone who's disoriented. What do you do if you don't know where Jerusalem is? As Saul Lieberman points out in his commentary to the Tosefta, 2 Chronicles 6, 32, refers to the Gentile. And therefore, it says he should pray to this house because he can't enter the temple, and therefore he prays to the house and not in the house. This being the case, the climax of the Tosefta is curious because the cur it brings this verse about the Gentile, applies it to someone not in the house but near the house, and then says, I quote, it turns out that all of Israel are praying to one place. It takes this universalist verse and applies it to a Jew who somehow can't be in the temple but is near the temple. So here you have one of those kind of moves which takes a universalist verse and turns it into just Jews. Now we'll go in another direction. That was a hard one, but now comes an easier one. The next source, which is in Hebrew on your, to the right side of the back page, number three. The uh, could have been better. Ah, you know, it's not the same help as it used to be. Do it yourself. Here we go. The uh, next source is from Leviticus Rabbah. Leviticus Rabbah is a uh, Agadic Midrash, probably at around the 5th century here in Israel, which also surprises in its view of the historical function of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, the temple's predecessor, and its palliative effect on the nations. As we will see, this Midrash, attributed to an early 3rd century Amora, is reworked in later collection, which we'll see soon. We read in Leviticus Rabbah, it's a little blurred on yours, Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, but you'll hear it a bit in English and then it'll come up in the Hebrew. Had the nations of the world known how beneficial, how beneficial the, the Mishkan was for them, they would have surrounded it with encampments and fortresses. You find, that until the Mishkan, the tabernacle, was erected, the nations of the world would hear the sound of, the, of God's voice and they would defecate in their palaces. Not very congratulatory. The thrust of Rabbi Yeshua's idea is that the nations were unable to receive the power of God's word. And the tabernacle served to shield them from the terror of God's voice. Rabbi Yehoshua's point is probably a departure from an earlier Midrash, which talks about the nations when God gave the Torah at Sinai, the nations were trembling. They heard the voice also and they were shaking. And they come to Bilam, the famous prophet, and they said, what's going on? Is this another time God's going to destroy the world? The enormous power of God's voice, depicted in the biblical account of Sinai, reaches its crescendo in Psalm 29. The voice of the Lord is power. It breaks cedars. Kol Hashem bakoach, shover razim. The same awesome voice speaks to Moses in the tabernacle. But according to our source, the Gentiles are mercifully sheltered from its power. They don't get God's word, not directly anyway. That being the case, there's a change of tone between the passage we read in the Mechilta where the nation is shaking and our Leviticus Rabbah passage. The Leviticus Rabbah passage is uncomplimentary. It's trying to shield these poor Gentiles by <coughs> talking about them defecating in their palaces. Terrible. This has displaced the lighter, almost comic tone of the passage about the, the nations coming to Bilam. The mocking tone of the later Midrash accords well with other sources of Jewish history that mock idolatry and idolaters, which begins in Isaiah and continues through rabbinic times. But it's clear that Joshua and Levi's notion that the tabernacle protected the nations from God's word stands in counterpoint, ironic counterpoint, to Solomon's dedication of the temple. 
the temple was supposed to be a source of salvation. And here it's blocking them from God's word. Negatively thought takes this very anti-Gentile thought in Leviticus Rabbah and turns it on its head, restoring to it the universalistic <coughs> motif in Solomon's prayer. And this is the left-hand side from the Tanchuma. This later Midrash, Tanchuma, edited somewhere in the 6th, 7th, 8th century in Israel, cites the Leviticus Rabbah passage, that nasty one, and continues, though, with the discussion of the temple. It's marked on your verse, and here's what it says. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said, were the nations of the world to know how beneficial the temple was for them, they would have surrounded it with encampments to protect it. Why? For thus did Solomon arrange in his prayer. That's a little farther down. Minayim shishlomo sider filato, the four lines from the bottom of the Hebrew. You will do all that the stranger calls out to you, so that all the peoples of the land will know your name. But when it comes to Israel, what was written, you should give to each person according to his way. We have then a duplicate version of Rabbi Yoshua, but augmented by a passage that claims that the temple is a stronger period for the Gentiles than the tabernacle. The Tanchuma passage takes the universalism of Solomon's prayer one step farther, insisting that the language of the prayer in 2 Chronicles 6 actually accords the Gentile preferential treatment. The individual Jew's prayer is only answered according to the worthiness of the one praying. But according to the Tanchuma source, the Gentile's request of the God of Israel is automatically answered, disregarding the issue of worthy or not worthy. This dispensation is offered in order to teach the Gentile to revere the God of the Jews. In Solomon prayer, the Gentile turns to the God of Israel after a hearing of God's mighty deeds. In our source, God converts the Gentiles by immediately fulfilling their request. The passage culminates in the future world, which we won't talk about, but you can already feel there's a bit of a patronizing tone here. How can we explain the shift in attitude from the Leviticus Rabbah, which mocked the Gentile, to the later Tanchuma, which seems to be universal and favor? This is especially a question because Israel Canole showed in an early article that the, the tables are reversed in terms of sacrifices. The earlier sources claim that Gentiles cannot offer sacrifices, and our later sources says Gentiles can't offer sacrifices. Go figure it. Let us turn to one more source, and then I'll give you some summary, some uh, reflection. In Psalms 65, which is not in front of you, but you all know by heart, it says, Praise befits you, Zion, O God, vows are paid to you. All mankind comes to you, you who hear Prayer. Well, happy is the person you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. The new JPS renders kol basar yavo adecha as mankind. It really it means literally all flesh. This in the Psalms that immediately surrounded envisage recognition of Israel's God by all people. As in Solomon's prayer, this prayer thinks in Psalms, that all flesh, all humans approach God in prayer. Now, I do a piece here on versions of this in the uh, rabbinic literature, but I'm going to leave it out and go to the summary. I want to return now to the opening passages of 1 Kings 8 and Isaiah 56 to summarize how I think the rabbis read these universalist strains. All of Israel we saw in the Tosefta place to praise to one place wherever they may be. Brings the people together in a sense that we're all directed to the same place. The Deuteronomist, that's uh, according to biblical scholarship, the author of One Kings, God Solomon's Prayer, he holds that God's name was in the temple, though God resided up in heaven. 
since even the heavens, according to Deuteronomy, can't accommodate, accommodate the divine. God, according to what we, we learned in Psalms and everywhere else, is attentive to the Gentile who comes to pray. But it would seem, unless I'm being overly literal, that only when the Gentile physically approaches the temple in Jerusalem, either on a physical pilgrimage, seeking aid, or is there a national acclamation? That's when he's listened to or she's listened to. Only when physically the Gentile comes here. The later Tenkhum Midrash went as far as to accord to the Gentile prayer in Jerusalem immediate and unconditional acceptance, a patronizing concession to the Gentiles' recognition of the God of Israel. Ironically, in late Second Temple times, the Gentile was greeted when, he, when the Gentile arrived in the temple outskirts by the Soreg inscription, which said, no Gentile can enter under pain of death. We know that from epigraphic stones we've got with these inscriptions, and Josephus says the same. Now, as he, these are more reflections for our own day. As Yochan Muffs taught us many years ago, Second Temple Judaism, before the rabbis, sees a shift from temple-centered religion to Bible-centered. From Psalms 23's vision of luxuriating in God's house, Shifti Bevet Adonai, call you Mechayad Achazot with Noam Adonai, to Psalm 119's Pian to the Law, eight times the alphabet, times, what is it, 22, 24? And eight verses for each, talking about the glories of the law. So there's a shift in this early psalm to the late psalm. Where is the best place to be? Is it to be in God's temple or to be occupied with God's law? The most fortunate Jews in late Second Temple times combined both. They studied and preached in the temple. This is attested in the Tosefta of Sanhedrin, which I won't talk about, and also, some of you know it from the Synoptic Gospels. The Christians are sitting in the courts of the Lord, preaching and learning. Peter and Paul are reported to have gone to the temple to pray at the time that Tamid was being offered. So we've got good evidence that in the late Second Temple times, the first century of our common era, people were studying in the temple, praying in the temple, and sacrificing. We had it all. But when the temple was destroyed for the second time in 70, Torah became the ultimate locus, the ultimate place of God's presence. We're reading Pirkei Avot these weeks. Two were studying, the Lord is with them. God's words were in some way part of God. So if you were studying God's word, that's where God was. A bitter debate ensued in rabbinic literature as to whether Gentiles should be allowed access to God's word, God's Torah, as they were denied access to the temple. So Rabbi Yochanan says in the Talmud, Goy Shomei Torah, Chayab Nita. A non-Jew who studies Torah should be killed. Goy Shomar Shabbat. As opposed to even Rabbi Meir who says, Goy Hawase Torah, He's been, uh, a guy who does Torah is bigger than a Kohen Gadol. You've got the debate going on. In or out? It was Leopold Suns in his magnificent 1832 history of Midrash who wrote that the synagogue and the Torah had become the national homeland of the Jew. The Torah became the ultimate guarantor of Jewish nationalism. But as we all know, it's a mobile home. Caravan, as we would say. Was it really necessary any longer to study God's Torah in God's temple in Jerusalem? Or was it always the case, as Simon Ravadavitz would claim, that there was never, ever one center? There were always at least two foci, Babylonia and Israel, New York and Israel, Read Rabbi Davids's essay. In short, what I'm trying to say is, both the question of inside in Israel and outside of Israel, the question of the place of the Gentile has been a source of contention from Second Temple times to 
Mr. Leto. Thank you. Now and then we have some time for discussion at the end of the session. I have a question. What, what do we know about the origin of the strict prohibition of Gentiles entering the temple? I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it seems to be not. I mean, it doesn't. Seem in the it doesn't need to be a biblical prohibition. Um, well, it depends which part. We know there are parts that only priests can go in. So the question is, in the Ezrat and Ashib, were there non-Jews allowed in there? Uh, I think before Josephus, to the best of my recollection, I don't remember it. But, you know, I can't, I can't bring up the Second Temple stuff right now, but it's a good question. Okay, thank you. Uh, how many centuries are we going now? So many. 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 So, uh, moving into the Middle Ages, uh, I'd like to introduce you Benjamin Gampel, who is the Dina and Ellie Field Family Chair in Jewish History at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He teaches courses in medieval and early modern Jewish history with a special focus on medieval Sephardim and lectures widely on the entire range of Jewish history. Dr. Gamper spent close to a year doing research in local archives in Spain for his first book, The Last Jews on Iberian Soil. Soil sorry. After much painstaking work, Dr. Gamper was able to recreate some of the long forgotten history of the Jews in the Iberian Peninsula. He also edited the volume Crisis and Creativity in the Sephardic World. Dr. Gamper returned to the Spanish archives for his current project, a book-length treatment of the riots and forced conversions in 1391 on the Iberian Peninsula. He just told me that he just returned again from Barcelona and Valencia, and he really praised the Valencia's high school. Amen. <laughs> So, um, Professor Gamper will talk about the construction of insider and outside in medieval Ashkenaz and Sepharad. And he asked me to release the microphone. Oh, you're here. I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first, uh, it's lovely to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michael Gillis and Nachum Hershey for treating us outsiders as if we were insiders and making us feel very welcome here, so I thank both of you. Today, whether we live in the Galut or we live in Israel, we can live in a Jewish world with a discussion of what belongs inside the Jewish tradition or who belongs as part of the Jewish people, and as a result, who should be designated as outsiders, and what ideas and concepts should be considered Jewish or not distinctly Jewish is subject to much debate. As you well know, and the ideas on both sides of this debate are not easily articulated. This title that you have been presented with, Insiders and Outsiders, and was presented to us by, I think, Michael Gillis, was grudgingly conceded to by the speakers. Because by agreeing to the title, we somehow give consent that there are insiders, and that there are outsiders, and there is an inside and there is an outside. 
And even if we could agree on this premise, that there is an inside and an outside, and by the way, Professor Judd, my host in Katamon brought out a Berenstein Bear book to show me, which did speak about insiders and outsiders. So both in Achtot HaBrit and here in Eretz Yisrael, we are confronted with these ideas on many, many different levels. But even if we could agree on this idea, we must imagine that the two of us from the United States might have quite a radically different idea than our colleague does from the Hebrew University. Just as perhaps you might imagine that two individuals from the secular universities of Ohio State and Hebrew University might have a different notion than I do as a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. But frankly, however, we decide who is in and who is out, we have to confront the basic notion that distinctions between inside and outside are simply not tenable. Any of this, us who have given this notion even a second of thought realize that many of the ideas that which we associate with Judaism, whether it's the biblical Israelite religion or whether it's Talmudic Judaism, originated from the so-called outside. And on the other hand, and this is a particular concern to us in the United States, ideas, customs, and traditions which we associate with the inside are now part and parcel of American culture. A few days after I left, I've been on the road for quite a while, I left right after Pesach, a reporter from the National Public Radio, Koki Roberts, a very well-respected reporter, married to a Jewish man, produced a wonderful Haggadah for intermarried couples. Yes, people who are on the outside can celebrate a Seder and celebrate Siddharim by reading from a Haggadah. And those Haggadot contain traditional elements. And something which I did mention before, at our first two rounds, we were treated in the United States to the wedding of a daughter of a former president, Chelsea Clinton, who marries a Jewish man. And the Chatan, we would all be so proud of Chovesh Kippah, wore a talit. They had a calligrapher do the ketubah. Ma'od nechmad. Not only that, they picked up the former president and the present secretary of state on chairs. How they picked up the former president is beyond me, but that's a physical question. And they danced. And they had Sheva Brachot. Chupa, Sheva Brachot. A yarmulke, a talit. So the, what I am saying is, and the reason why I bring this up, in here I must say I depart from normal academic conventions to confess my own issue as an American Jew. And that is, even as I am aware that it, distinctions between inside and outside are untenable, I also know that for the survival of the Jewish people, however I imagine it, distinctions have to be made between inside and outside. We have to artificially create these distinctions for group identity. I don't mean to enter into the Israeli conversation, but I imagine you can enter it on your own. So now, I truly begin with my paper. As the Yiddish wag always said, So the few words I have already said. Now for the paper. The Middle Ages 
We have fantasies of the Middle Ages, don't we? Jews under Islam, Jews under Christendom. This is the Mehabenayim. These are the Dark Ages. This is a time of restriction, a time of endless persecution. Redifot, forced conversion. What we imagine about the Middle Ages, don't we? That it's a time when boundaries are so clear. We imagine that maybe if insiders and outsiders had any sense to it, it would make sense within this period. Yes, Jews lived under Christendom and Islam, and Christendom and Islam defined the Jew. Whether you wanted to be Jewish or not, was not particularly relevant. For Christianity, you were a Jew. You were descended from those who crucified Jesus. And as a people who was guilty of de deicide, you were subject to restrictions. Not only subject to restrictions, but also subject to blandishments over time to help you to convert to the true faith. And under Islam, I need not tell you, so much ink has been spilled. Jews and Christians were protected minorities. They were thimmies. They were second-class citizens. They had to pay special taxes. They had to wear clothes in a particular fashion. They couldn't look like Muslims. Clearly, we would imagine the Jews under Islam and Jews under Christendom, the boundaries were clear between inside and outside. Or well, so we would imagine. And what is fascinating is that where have Jews survived? If we give a general look at the entire world, Jews survived precisely under Christianity and under Islam. They survived precisely in areas where Jews were defined. And where Jews were not defined, let's say in India, Jews eventually disappeared. I don't want to use that term, hit bowl and looked, right? Just all sorts of contemporary connotations. The Jews disappeared, however they disappeared. I'm going to briefly alight on two periods, I would say very well-known periods of the history of the Jews under Islam and the history of the Jews under Christendom, to maybe get some sense and some flavor of what it meant to be insiders or outsiders. Everybody knows about the golden age of Spanish Jewry, don't we? Everybody can recite Yehuda Halevi's poem. I even did in my email to you, I think. I made a brief reference. It was pretty easy, even with the good ice cream, I must say. What was distinct about the golden age? What was distinct about the Golden Age was that Jews were able to be extraordinarily significant in the economic life of Al-Andalus. Jews were politically powerful, and yet, at the same time, Jews were culturally creative. They were religiously vital. We know that Jews read Muslim literature. We know that the greatest contributions of Sephardic Jewry in the Muslim period was very much infused with Muslim culture and civilization. We will speak about this tomorrow, but the entire educational curriculum, the notion of adab, the notion of a cultured Jew, which was one which was influenced by Islam, 
placing language at the center in the 10th century, following the Muslims. That's why Menachem ben Sahuk, do not shiv ben Labrat, write their theses on language. Seeing philosophy as the culminating reflection of an intellectual man. We know examples of that, don't we? Whether it's Yudah Halevi's Kuzari, whether it's Rambam's Moren Vuchim. That idea of philosophy being at the acme of the Jewish curriculum is Muslim. What was the grandeur of the golden age? The grandeur of the golden ages of the Jews whose Jews curriculum, which was formulated by Muslim culture, at least in terms of what was considered greater and lesser, it was written in the Hebrew language. And the Hebrew language was expanded at that time. Now, we know at the same time, so we don't have fantasies, as some people do of al Andalus, as if the Jews, Muslims, and Christians danced off into the sunset, dancing a horror while everybody uh, played music around them. There is no evidence that the Muslims read Jewish literature. We may, uh, may have, and I, maybe. I don't think they avoided each other so much as ah, the century. We don't know. We know that possibly uh, Shmuel Hanagid's contemporaries read his attacks on Islam. But they didn't read their poetry. They didn't read their Perushim on Chumash. And we also know that at the same time, at the same time, Shmuel Hanagid's son, Yosef Hanagid, is killed in Granada and 300 Jews are killed alongside of him. So are the Jews in or are they out? And soon I'll be out. <laughs> Let's just take a trip now. We're in the 11th century, thank you. We were talking to Shmuel Hanagid. Take a trip to the Cru Crusades. Masayat Slav. Oh! Here we don't imagine, right? All our fantasies about Sephardic golden age, right? It's sun, there's glida, there's dancing, there's rikud. It's just a wonderful time. On the other hand, Masayat Slav, this is the Crusades. Jews are murdered. We know they were murdered. They were murdered in Speyer, in Worms, in Mainz, in Regensburg. We know that. And we also know it shocked the people at the time, as it shocks us even today, that when we read the chronicles of, the Hebrew chronicles of the crusade, that many Jews, many Jews, am I about to get a petek? Soon I'm about to get a petek. I don't know what color, but soon I am going to get one. You know the number on it? Esther, four minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. Crusades don't take 10 minutes. They go over like that. Anyway, the. They really weren't. What the heck? The, if we look at the Crusades, but not at what happened, but how they were memorialized, the Jews who wanted to remember the Crusades, yes, spoke about the Jews being killed. Yes, they spoke about the forced conversion. But what they did speak about most of all, where did the Jews kill themselves rather than submit to Christianity? And they took a great leap because they called those people Mikadshe Hashem, people who died al Kiddush Hashem for the sanctification of God's name. Now we know that the Jews who killed themselves suicided. We know that, generally speaking, in Talmudic literature, those who killed themselves willingly are not considered Zmikad Hashem. Because it says, al Ya'avor. And if I read my Menachem ben Savo correctly, that means you should allow yourself to be killed, not kill yourself. But we know they did something else, don't we? They killed their children. They killed their wives. 
What would we call that today? <coughs> Murder. I'm not here to judge them. I'm here to describe. But when you read the people who wrote the Crusade Chronicles and read their ideas, here we imagine this Ashkenazic jury. We fantasize about them, that they're all close together. You all live apart. It's not like Sepharad. But the concept of Jews dying, their Mekadshe Hashem, that they die because they are there as a kapara for the original chet. And what is the original chet? For Jews, it's the chet ha'egel. Uviyom pakti, the Torah says. God threatens that when the day I will remember, this generation will pay. And what the Crusade Chronicles say is, the generation of the Crusades were chosen by God. Lihiyot lo lemana. Which means that the generation of Jews who killed themselves and killed their family during the Crusades died for the expiation of the original sin of Am Yisrael. What does that sound like? Christian theology. So how, who is inside and who is outside? And how is the outside used to protect the inside? And how are outside ideas, that doesn't mean that the Jews who killed themselves thought that, but that the Jews who want to defend them years later resorted to Christian theological ideas, knowingly or unknowingly, to justify what must have been terribly shocking. In the Middle Ages, and I'll skip over this lightly, there were attempts to define inside and outside. There were attempts, let's say by Menachem Neiri, the great Provencal Talmudist, to decide who is considered actually an Oved Kochavim, a Gentile, so Jews could do business with them three days before their holidays, if you know, remember the first mission of Odazara. We had conflicts over, right, the writings of Maimonides. Is that inside or outside? But there really it was not what was in and out. You could study Maimonides, but the question was, would the study of the Moreh, or the Sefer Hamadab, the Mishneh Torah, would that lead you not to observe mitzvot? That was the real issue. So what we see is that as much as boundaries in medieval times, as you can tell by my voice I'm reading, were so markedly constructed, we can also appreciate the porousness of these boundaries and the challenges that medieval Jews made in making insider and outsider distinctions. There have been attempts to understand Jewish culture in the Middle Ages as a hybrid, taking from a variety of sources, or if that Jews and Christians or Jews and Muslims shared in a general culture. That's all to be recognized. But what we see from the Middle Ages is that even with the limitations, even with the persecutions, the boundaries are porous. And in that sense, in that small sense, medieval Jews faced some of the same challenges that we do today to determine what can and what cannot be accepted. Thank you. Two questions, so yes. please. Okay, it's, a, it's a more of a reflection, it's a recollection of something that uh, happened during a shoot of Rabbi Shlomo Karla, which I have the privilege of having been in Talmud. This is a definition of the inside outside that I hear, and uh, this is how I recall it, but I don't recall the other. Now, imagine an onion, each layer has an inside and an outside. 
the moment you get rid of the outside layer, automatically the next layer, layer becomes the outside and is exposed to oxidating air, while the inside that was there is lost. And so on and so forth, all the way to, all the, way to the center. In other words, there is not a pure insider and a pure outsider. Each one is in relation to a concentric arrangement. I think I'll stop at that. That's a nice metaphor, thank you. Uh, the notion of, uh, in the, that in the time of the Crusades, they, they reflected on uh, what, what was happening to them as an expiation for the sin of Diego Azab. The Talmud is already, the Talmud, we have lots of concepts of people, Sadiqim mm -hmm. die as an expiation for the sins of the past. Right, it's not specifically Christian there, mm -hmm. necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're saying it is already Christian in the time of the Talmud, are you saying it's the same? Probably. The same, it's an extension of that, yes. something new. I think what is an additional item here is that these Jews killed, for example, members of their family. And to say that that act, I didn't say of murder, is part of the grandeur of that generation, I think that takes it a step further. And if this is really, I'm following here in what has been published by the Crusade Chronicles. It's it's just striking. They even use the term Kiddush Hashem, or to stretch it. And by the way, the term Kiddush Hashem has been stretched over time. Now, Kiddush Hashem, if you wish to send your child at some expense to a religious school, it's a Kiddush Hashem. Boy, <laughs> pretty easy. Thank you. Um, well, this was a great, a great oratory and a very interesting lecture. Uh, but I do have a few puzzles, uh, puzzlements, as the King of Siam used to say. Yes. It is a puzzlement. Uh, because, for example, you said that the uh, an insider and outsider was a problem. It, it is a problem. But there are other issues, there are other terms that you've used in your own lecture which are also just equally problematic. For example, the Jewish people. Could you possibly define what that is? Would, would uh, most American Jews say that they're members of the Jewish people or the American people? Another term is the Galut, exile. I mean, from, from an Israeli point of view, you may be an exile, but from the point of view of the United States, you are, you're right there where you should be. So there's no exile. Uh, there's a question of Ashkenaz and Sephara. Both of them are biblical names which have nothing to do with Germany or Spain, as you know, of course. So, uh, and then the question of whether the Jews were living in Muslim culture, or was it the Arabic culture? I mean, they're both, but uh, the question is which aspect of it was more influential, and so on and so forth. I mean, these are all issues. Um, I appreciate that very much. Indeed, your puzzle is mine as well. Um, ultimately, we have to use language. And each one of our terms, as you say correctly, requires definition. Everything that you said I agree with, it's not clear. That's precisely the slipperiness of this terminology. And the only way that I could accept upon myself the responsibility of talking about inside and outside, and not to simply dismiss it out of hand, that was the beginning of my talk, is to recognize who I am from the perspective of where I live and my own culture. So if I wish, I wish to maintain an identification as a Jew, however you would like to speak about that, within the Galut, within the diaspora, within America, I need to create distinctions whether those distinctions ultimately will fall apart upon analysis. It's a human need to belong to a group. And one of those constructions, and parenthetically, I look forward to talking about that tomorrow, because then it influences how we construct curriculum for students. If we know we're consciously constructing an identity, and therefore we need to create an inside and outside. We're aware of its artificiality. So all your questions simply point to that.
It's an artificial construction. But a construction that is necessary for my own self-perception. Satisfying, I don't know. No, I, I but was thinking honest. of Yerushalmi Zachor, and I don't want to go into all his theories there, but obviously there's a question of reality and fantasy. Yes. And we have the past and present. And yes. Whether the Jews are actually, where are living in the Middle Ages, in fantasy or in reality, in the past or in the present. I'm happy you mentioned my teacher, who just passed away a year ago, and I appreciate those words. Yes, uh, you talk about the family being porous, but from the example, it's not, it's a, it's a one-way porousness. It's like a kind of valve, where it seems that the influence comes uh, in one direction only. And I mean, I'm interested to hear how far you go with this. I mean, here, some of the, I'm aware of some of the uh, uh, most recent uh, Jewish historiography, which seems to go to some extremes uh, in seeing, um, almost in sort of deny any uh, inherent uh, Jewish uh, creativity, and it's all a matter of absorbing influence and response. Mm -hmm. and, I, and here I'd like to maybe add a side question to Menachem, if Gabi will allow it to go that way, because we hinted at the beginning, we said, this has always been the case, even in rabbinic uh, culture. It, it's essentially a product of some outside influence. I'll be interested mm. to hear from Manachem if he buys that. Please do. I won't think, I'll start to talk. Menachem is going to reflect. So <laughs> we'll see what we, co we both come up with under different circumstances. Um, yes, I know I am. <laughs> because it is, it's a dangerous subject to answer. The implications have political, religious, national significance. It's not simply Jews and Judaism, their peoplehood and their religion, which is porous. So are the other cultures and other religions. Everything ultimately leaks into each other. But it's our own consciousness, and that's the response to the question that I heard earlier, of trying to maintain a specific identity which is significant. I can read the Crusade Chronicles and be conscious of a certain underlying Christological formulation. Even as I appreciate its Hebrew, I am conscious of the midrashic echo, the gentleman who I spoke to, uh, conscious of the midrashic formulation and understand that very intimately to be Jewish culture. I don't see those things as opposed. I'm just recognizing feelings and constructions and points of departure. So I will not go to the radical extreme because that ultimately is meaningless. It doesn't provide us with any identity. And what we're all about here is the construction of some sense of self and group. Yes. <laughs> the rabbinic literature is sui generis. Well, you know, it's literary. It was a very, you know, attempted to be a very native, closed system. I really think it's I think they constructed a world of their own. It was here in Israel or in Babylon or wherever it was, but uh, they called their highest institution by a Greek word. They called their their institution for getting rid of you know problems of the seventh year by a Greek word. That's strange. So there's there's certainly they were they were infected by the outside culture and assimilating it in a profound way. And then they did their best to, to try to develop a way of doing their thought, which was their own. In terms of influencing others, I think that was a good question. How come it sounds, I mean, Benji said that they didn't read us, right? But at least now Philip Roth got the Booker Prize, so I guess somebody's reading us, if that's us, is that right? Uh, who read rabbinics? We know the Christians read the rabbi. And even some pagans had something to do with it. So, I'm not a poor person, you know. <laughs> Thank you. As a social psychologist, I'm more interested in the, the 
exceptions of porosity, can you see that? Uh, porosity itself, but this can wait tomorrow. And we should let's see it also things to comment. And if not, think towards tomorrow because I will ask you. Um, thank you. So let's move to the modern times. Uh, Robin Jad joined the Department of History at the Ohio State University in 2000 as a specialist in Jewish and European history. She completed her doctoral degree at the University of Michigan in May 2000. Professor Jad's manuscript contested rituals, circumcision, culture butchering, and German Jewish political life in Germany in 1843 to 1933 was published in 2007 by Cornell University Press. Professor Jad has received several grants, including the College of Humanities, Virginia Health Research Award, and NEH Summer Stipend, the Coca-Cola Grant for Critical Difference, and the 2001 Clio Award for Teaching. She has presented her work in the United States, Europe, and Israel, here now once again. She teaches modern Jewish history, German history, and women's history. Thank you. Ah. And sorry, and the title of the lecture will be Neither In Nor Out Jewish War Brides and Integration Narratives 1945 to 1950. I'd love to tell you that uh, when I'm not jet lagged, I have as much energy as Benji, but that was uh, not entirely the case. <coughs> so, moving on to the uh, modern period and, and particularly the post war. It's a truism of modern Jewish historical scholarship that in the modern period, the relationships, real or imagined, desired or disdained, between insiders and outsiders shaped Jewish lives. One of the characteristics of the modern Jewish experience was both the desire expressed by many to identify as either Jewish insider or to leave the Jewish communal outsider, and the freedom to act on that impulse. As such, Jewish historians attempt to identify the boundaries which have bracketed Jewish communities over time. They implicitly or explicitly gaze at the fluid, dynamic, and constantly shifting boundaries among several different insider and outsider groups to explore historical questions concerning emancipation, enlightenment, secularization, integration, and anti-Semitism. With few exceptions, Many modern Jewish scholars use the non-Jewish world as a way to name who is in and out, and whether the insiders or outsiders or Jews or non-Jews um, can change. How they construct these categories of insider and outsider, and how they envision the Jewish identities resulting from the meaning of insiders and outsiders very much depends on the individuals writing the history and the historical agents they study. My first book concerned the ways in which Jews in Central Europe used rituals to delineate insiders from outsiders. In this project, I asked why circumcision and kosher butchering came to serve as touchstones for Jews and non-Jews between 1843 and 1933. Working on that project, I found that several overlapping groups looked to Jewish rights to create standards for who was in and who was out. Now that I have completed this project, I have reservations about my ability to say something new concerning the Jews gazing at the non-Jewish world. But today I'm going to attempt to address this question by looking to communal identity construction and reconstruction during a period in the modern, in the modern era when national and cultural boundaries were frequently envisioned as imper impermeable. I'm going to explore the complicated and highly gendered relationships among liberated European Jewish women, mostly survivors of the Shoah, and non-Jewish European women in France, Belgium, Austria, and occupied Germany during the period immediately following the Nazis' defeat. Such an analysis extends the study of insider-outsider relationships into a chronologically more contemporary realm. It reveals that Jews and non-Jews encountered one another in post-war Europe in ways and with a frequency that have previously been assumed impossible. My examination will unpack the ways in which predictable tensions and unexpected friendships created in the aftermath of devastation shaped Jewish communal construction and identity construction. 
So first, to the term war bride, because I'm going to be using it a lot. The term war bride refers to foreign women who marry military personnel stationed overseas. The vast majority of GI brides during the Second World War originated from Britain and Australia and self-identified as Protestant. However, between 1945 and 1950, hundreds of thousands of women married American military men stationed in Germany, France, Austria, Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria. A portion of these women were Jews. The Jewish war brides considered here were part of the surviving remnant of European Jewry living in France, Belgium, Austria, or the American occupied zone of Germany. Or they were Jewish women who fled the Soviets and made their way to the American occupied zone. They were insiders and outsiders. They were displaced people. However, they were assured passage to the United States. And this is quite significant among the displaced person population, which was still until the 1950s, or uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, dealing with the quota system set up by the Johnson Act of 1923. What the War Bride Act of 1945 and the Fiancés Act of 1946 does is it circumvents the quota. So essentially, this is the first non-restrictive immigration legislation passed in the United States. So it's sort of a significant moment in immigration history. They were European women who could bypass anti-fraternization laws. So the American military and the British military had set up a, a large numbers of anti-fraternization policies, and there was exceptions made to the particularly Jewish women uh, because they were seen as a particular kind of victim status. The European Jewish brides were an oddity then in post-war Europe. Afforded the opportunity for intimate proximity with non-Jews, they engaged with Christian women, some even former perpetrators, in unexpected ways. Within the context of these relationships, they adapted discourses of loss, sexuality, and femininity, among others, to construct their identities as Jewish women. In her pivotal study, Jews, Germans, and Allies, Close Encounters in Occupied Germany, Atina Grossmann rejects previous scholarly assumptions that Jews and Germans actively avoided one another during the post-war period. Drawing on a wide range of sources, she reveals constant interaction among diverse Jews, Germans, and occupiers. Members of these heterogeneous groups, she argues, lived as neighbors. In the aftermath of the Second World War, Jews did not merely reside in Germany, she argues, but they coexisted with Germans in unforeseen ways. This was true in Europe, and especially true of the war brides. Interacting with one another as the European girlfriends and fiancés of American GIs, these women traverse boundaries that might have otherwise divided them. Six sites of interaction were particularly common. First, they met as the serious girlfriends, fiancés, or wives of other GIs. Soon after she began dating Mort, whom she met at the Frankfurt Synagogue Center, Helena befriended two other GI girlfriends, Stasia, a survivor originally born in Eastern Europe, and Anna, a local typist who worked at the base. The three of us would spend hours together, she remembered, although only Stasia and I would go to synagogue center on Friday nights. Second, war brides frequently lived in common war bride homes, individual homes or complexes established by the US military to house war brides before their departure. Uh, and I should say that women, even women who weren't living in these war bride homes had to actually depart from war bride um, immigration centers as they left either France or England on their way to the United States. The headquarters of the European Theater of Operations of the U.S. Army, for example, transformed three apartment buildings in Bremerhaven to house nearly 500 women. So we're really talking about kind of fairly large communities of women living together. Third, the brides enrolled in communal Americanization classes and waited for their papers to come to the United States. Every day, recalled Anna Russell, I would go to the bulletin board to see if my papers had come through. The same girls were there. We started to talk. Sometimes we would sit and knit or read, but most of the time we talked. We became friends. In addition, the women traveled with each other to the United States. By limiting us to six diapers a day, remembered a Jewish war bride, we had to meet one another. I tried to find out which mother needed less. We were a circle of moms on the boat, and we tried to help each other out. I saw my first American movie offered a third bride with other fiancés like me. We used to meet at the screenings of American movies and then practice speaking English afterwards. 
One of the girls there was Jewish and spoke German with an accent. In Europe and on the ships, the Red Cross also offered classes on American geography, cooking, and fashion. As war brides, these women occupied a space that was unusual within post-war Europe. Finally, these relationships continued beyond the war bride homes and ships. The Red Cross and other organizations offered war bride courses and services throughout the United States. Many of the war brides took part in war bride associations. Some of these organizations are still in existence today. We were talking about this earlier, but next year they're planning a reunion on the Queen Elizabeth um, sailing back to England. So in the aftermath of upheaval and genocide, the war brides looked to non-Jewish brides and to Jewish DPs to articulate their senses of insider and outsider. Many Jewish war brides envisioned themselves as somehow distinct from and possibly even disliked by their female, female co-religionists. They were insiders when compared to these co-religionists and outsiders um, compared to the non-Jewish brides. Um, they're marked by a new privilege and a new national identity. So what do I mean? First, most of the Jewish brides had access to physical spaces that were only available to GIs and their families. For Lala, her new room was so different from her life in the DP barracks, where according to her recollection, there was barbed wire still everywhere. In contrast, her new home was cheery and filled with smiles. Second, these women had begun an acculturation process that diverged from many of the DPs. As I mentioned earlier, they took English classes, they watched American movies, and they were learning domestic skills that differed from those classes being offered to DP women. Lala, whom I mentioned before, switched from a Hebrew class sponsored by the Hafsara to an English class offered by the International Red Cross. With other brides, she would all the time study, study English. Clara also began to spend less time, and here I'm just quoting, with my Jewish friends, and spend more time with my new friend, learning English at class. I was, after all, going to America, while my friends from the Haqsara were going to Palestine. Third, the Warbright's testimonies, letters, and interviews offer a characteristic, another characteristic that supposedly separated the GI brides from their Jewish friends and brought them closer to other brides. Despite, or perhaps because of, their own fragile health, Jewish war brides often commented on the physical and mental ill-being of their co-religionists and the health and vigor of the non-Jewish brides. Insiders were healthy, outsiders were not. In a November 1945 letter, Clara compared herself with the girls she saw at the Jewish Museum in Munich, and this was the sort of central point for DPs in Munich, where there had been so many unhappy girls with so many complicated miseries. Thanking, and here she quotes, Providence for having me spared much of that, she was relieved that she had the physical and mental, mental strength that they lacked. Like her non-Jewish friend Gretchen, she, quote, had a great home and a great love. As part of an insider group, the Jewish war brides also juxtaposed, juxtaposed their certain futures with the unknown future of their co-religionists. For Lala, I knew what I wanted and where I was going. My friends at the DP camp had no plans. I have met with some of the girls I knew in camp, wrote Gerda in December 1945, and am depressed and keenly disappointed. These close, intimate entanglements and friendships may have affirmed the Jewish war brides' identities as insiders within Europe, but they did not, however, present, prevent the predictable and significant tensions that arose. In their reflections on the non-Jewish women with whom they interacted, Jewish war brides also commented on the characteristics that distance them from non-Jewish women. To do so, they invoke discourses of loss, sexuality, and femininity to construct their Jewish identities. For most of the Jewish war brides considered here, their wartime experience stamped their identities and as such distanced them from their non-Jewish friends. After baking Christmas cookies with other Bremerhaven wives, one Jewish bride wrote to her husband, who was already in the United States, what have I just done? For a few wonderful minutes, I recaptured something, but how could I have done that? I should hate them in their holidays, but I find myself unable to do that. For Aurelia, when I first went to the bulletin board, I kept away from those who weren't like us. Where had their brothers or fathers been? And there's a very interesting kind of gendered way in which she plays out uh, this question of victimhood and perpetratorhood. 
Aurelia remembers that soon after going to the bulletin board for the first time, she sought out the Jewish chaplain and made arrangements to take a course with him about Jewish marriage and family. Such courses were quite popular among the Jewish war brides. In their chaplain reports, several DP and military chaplains commented on the frequency with which they offered courses or clubs for Jewish wives. And there's a whole series of sort of syllabi that these DP chaplains <coughs> offer on how to be a Jewish bride. And for many, that's their introduction to Judaism. In addition to discourses of victimhood, sexuality frequently served as a key trope when affirming or negotiating their senses of self as Jewish brides. Many of the Jewish brides differentiated Jewish sexual behavior from non-Jewish, identifying a deviance in the non-Jewish behavior and a respectability in the Jewish one. Sarah remembered, quote, the non-Jewish brides were different. They were, what's the word, provocative. Aurelia similarly recalled, there was one German who was very, very pretty and married to a very, very young GI. She was pregnant. Everyone knew that she was pregnant with some other man's child, but she had convinced this American boy that it was his. The Goyesha brides were not like us. They had all sorts of romantic liaisons. Jewish women offered a form of respectable femininity. And for these brides, looking at the non-Jewish compatriots often helped throw their Jewish identities into relief. The Jewish war brides, then, offer us one interesting case study in modern Jewish history that can deepen our understanding of post-war Europe and complicate existing narratives concerning Jews and non-Jews. You don't need to worry about the paper. Their history encourages scholars to engage with the hybridity. It's a mom, I can see out of all my I can see out of all eyes. Their history encourages scholars to engage with the hybridity of post-war European Jews and non-Jews and to complicate notions of insider and outsider. As friends and as enemies, war brides shape the transnational and gendered character of their constantly shifting communities. Interacting with one another as the European girlfriends and fiancés of American GIs. These women traverse boundaries that otherwise would have divided them, and in so doing, simultaneously challenged and reified the identities that they were in the process of constructing. Thank you. Behind, 
Um, because these women during the war had been sending care packages, right? They had been writing letters. They were preparing themselves to marry the men who came home. And what happens? The men come home with um, these women. Um, and so that's, that, that's some of the dynamic that I'm, I'm interested in following through as well. Unless I missed it, you didn't differentiate in your talk between Jewish war brides who were marrying Jewish servicemen and Jewish war brides who were marrying non-Jewish servicemen, which, and presumably for them thinking about what was their inside and which was the outside and which was the inside or outside they were going to, that, I'm assuming that may have been a significant thing. Yes. Um, you're absolutely right, I didn't differentiate, and part of the reason why I didn't di differentiate is because most of, the literature, most of the literature that I'm finding, and that may be because I'm working backwards, right? I'm finding Jewish war brides who in some ways have left some hint that they were Jewish war brides, locating them and then trying to find their papers and other things. Most of the women that I found married Jewish men. Now there are some exceptions uh, to the rule, um, and in fact, uh, those exceptions are quite interesting and I deal with them elsewhere, but very often I find out more about them through their husband's narratives um, and not their own. So for example, there's a, in my world, a fairly well-known case of a Jewish woman who marries a non-Jewish man and she's detained at Ellis Island um, and it's through her husband's attempts to get her released from Ellis Island and the reason why she's detained is because she was um, from the, well, she A was from the now former Soviet Union, and B, her um, husband is a communist and he's been blacklisted. And there's a whole other kind of narrative that happens in the war bride question where all these women who in the beginning have sort of expedited status to come, those who had fled the Soviet occupied zone and come to the American zone, now they're questionable because they may be communists themselves. And so I find. I, I found some of the Jewish, non-Jewish marriages through that, but uh, most of the women that I'm finding are, are marrying Jewish men. Uh, now, that's not the same for the Jewish men. Uh, there are many Jewish men who are marrying non-Jewish women, and the Jewish chaplains have um, a whole set of responsa. Kenra has a whole responsa around this, and um, a number of the Jewish organizations become very worried about these Jewish GIs who are being seduced by um, German and British women um, who just want to come to the United States, but that's a worry about the non-Jewish women. Um, I, I'm not finding as many Jewish women marrying non-Jewish men. No. Uh, I sense among the refugees from World War II who remain very religious, Hasidim and so forth, both the rabbis and the people, a tremendous drive, not just to have a good life personally, after all they suffered, but to rebuild their religious communities as in Europe, five, 10, 12 children, a certain tremendous joy as they grew up and got married and so forth. Do you sense that also among the non-religious uh, mm -hmm. Jewish workers? That's interesting. I mean, there we, we do see a fair bit of fertility among these women um, that uh, I mentioned before, the six diapers a day. Um, the, you, know, you can just imagine the military, you know, which is now has to outfit these ships to uh, prepare for, the, for these babies. I mean, that's what's so fascinating in some ways about the American case versus the British or Canadian, which is that the American military is responsible for getting all these war brides to the United States. Um, and so, yes, we do see um, a, a desire to rebuild quickly, um, to have children quickly. Sometimes they have them very, very quickly, um, namely before they get married. Um, and uh, and so, so there's definitely that kind of narrative about, about reconstruction and what does reconstruction mean. Um, but it's nothing compared to the number of children that we see in uh, more traditional circles of, within the DP community of the refugee community. Ah, it was, it was, oh. uh, ah, you were helping me out. Okay. Uh, well, um, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you all. I'm keeping my...
conclusions for tomorrow. Tomorrow, as I said, um, the distinguished speakers will meet with faculty and students of the medical center at 12.30 at the seminar room 303. So those of you who would like to join uh, are most welcome. And uh, thank you all for your attendance. And shalom and be